Hi, I'm Aprajita Jain and welcome to the fourth episode of Art Insider. Our collectors today are more daring and enthusiastic about contemporary art. Our first guest is Mr. Akshay Chudasima, a prominent lawyer from Mumbai, an international traveler and a general bon vivant. His passion for collecting began with books and now continues with art. I spoke to him at a seaside home in Mumbai. Welcome to our show. Thanks for uh, agreeing to do this interview. Um, Thank you I for thought, having me. I thought we'd go and try and understand your art evolution over the years. So can you tell us a little bit about when and what you started collecting? So I guess um, I started collecting when I came back from university uh, in the early 90s. And at that stage, I, you know, my office used to be right in the heart of the art district in Kalagoda. And uh, so ever so often, I just walk into galleries from time to time. And slowly, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like a drug, right? You get addicted and you keep seeing different kinds of work, different artists. Pretty much over the last seven, eight years, or maybe even the last 10 years, my focus has been much more on contemporary artists, so much so that I would say uh, 80 or 90% of everything that I buy is contemporary today. Can you tell us about some of your favorite uh, contemporary pieces? Um, yeah, so at the moment I'm quite fascinated with uh, Imran Qureshi. Uh, you know, uh, he's he's the he's the um, you know he's he's my he's my sort of flavor of the month if if, if I can say that. Um, I've been sort of following him for a long time, and I've you know finally managed to get a good work of his, so I'm quite happy about that. Uh, I'm very fond of artists like Gigi Scaria. I think uh, they appeal a lot to me. Um, so uh, there's 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 lots of them. I think Asim Wakif is is fantastic. Um, I've just bought a work of a Bangladeshi artist called Naeem Mohamian. Um, so Akshay, how do you select a piece of work, or do you select the artist or the work, or is it an impulsive buy? Um, so you know, there's there's no one size fits all. Uh, sometimes it's it's impulse, but invariably I research. Uh, you know, I, I do a little bit of research. I sort of talk to galleries. I uh, talk to friends and what's very important for me is to try and meet with the artists, understand their thought process behind work uh, and obviously it has to be visually appealing to you if it's not uh, then you know that's like a threshold but um, but I over time I, I believe that I've become slightly more discerning with the kind of artists that I that I choose that I buy um, and it's very important for me to understand their entire thought process behind a particular work that I may have bought. Our second guest is a young and dynamic Vishal Mehta, a prominent businessman from the jewellery industry. He also sits on Tate's South Asian Acquisition Committee. Let's speak to him for more thoughts. Start collecting the I started in 2006 and it was actually inspired by my father-in-law who is a great collector of Indian modern art and just seeing such beautiful works and seeing this really beautiful collection inspired me to actually go out and look for artwork of my own. So Vishal, what are the four artists that you're focusing on and why? So, um, one thing about us that you have to know is that we're not um, country focused. We are global citizens having lived in many different places, so our artists are from four different parts of the world. Um, you have Dylan Lewis, who is a fantastic sculptor from South Africa, uh, who creates these beautiful, almost Giacometti-esque type of uh, sculptures of cats. Uh, you have um, Imran Qureshi, who has been my sort of favorite at the moment as well. Um, beautiful abstract works uh, and beautiful miniatures as well, which uh, if you get a chance, it is one of the ones that I would really recommend. And uh, the fourth is Indian, which is Manjit Bawa. I feel he is still uh, one of the most underappreciated Indian artists. Um, I think his work says a lot about our culture. It says a lot about our um, color palette. It says a lot about who we are as Indians. 
And so when, how did you, how do you go about this process? I mean, from, I can see a lot of different varying uh, artworks in your home currently. How have you gone from Irana and Rashid Rana to becoming focused about four artists? So the process is really focused on becoming a patron for four artists and really becoming an important collector for four artists. Who we are as individuals and what we leave for the world is very important. You know, businesses actually don't last. If you look, a lot of businesses don't actually make the third generation. Um, institutions do, museums do. So to be remember to make a mark in history and in human society the only way you can do that is to become a patron of the arts what would your advice be to a young collector at the age of maybe 25 who doesn't have so much disposable income and how would, how should he begin research 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 three things that you can do today if you are going to buy an artist make sure you know what the artist is producing look at the entire body of work understand why the artist is painting it as well. Does it resonate with you on a conscious level? Does it resonate with you on a subconscious level? Does it speak to you as an artist, uh, as an artwork? That's what you need to do. The other thing as well is make sure you can live with it day in, day out. You that's know, critical. You don't want to hang something in your home and then a year later decide that's not what I want. I generally end up doing most of my research on the internet. Uh, I spend about an hour or two every single day just researching. Wow, that's... And you, you know, there's probably 20, 30 websites that can help out uh, just to be able to understand artists, to find out what's going on. Um, can you name a few? Uh, sure, you have um, Artnet, which is a great one just on being able to price art. You have Artsy, which is a new website that's come up as well, which is a marketplace for art. You have um, Art News, Art Review. There are so many. I mean, they, there are countless ones. And if you're really plugged into the space, they'll find you or you'll find them. It's time for a short break. But do come back because there's lots waiting on the other side. Welcome back. Ashish Shah is one of Mumbai's most charismatic and sought-after interior designers. He helps his clients by cutting-edge works that not only energize their spaces but eventually their lives. I met with him at a home he recently finished and I can't wait to show you more about his thought process. Welcome to the show, Ashish. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this for us. Our viewers would love to know on how does one live with all this art that our artists are producing today? I think there are two ways of looking at it. One is either you have been a collector and you've been collecting, uh, collect, making collection and then you build a house around that. And the second uh, way would be that you bring in an architect first, you have the property and then you, as you go designing, as you go on with the process of design, you start collecting art individually for the spaces and start relating spaces with art. Um, this is the latter, you know, we started the process of designing, we started work on site and then we said, what about art? You know, that was that question that, that, that question that every client fears and when it comes to me at least, because I love incorporating art in my projects because I feel that uh, that gives the real soul. So tell us about so bare bricks of it all. So how would you live with works in a small apartment like sculpture, video art? So I mean, can we go across how you engage, how you help people live with it? So I, I'm 
predominantly not scared of art. I think the biggest thing about art is fear. I think everyone fears the fact that this, this piece of art is going to overrule or overpower my design. You know, most of the times architects fear that. I think that's a wrong notion. I think art always kind of embraces your design and also enhances it. Um, what I try to do is I try to take the most challenging scale and put it in the most, uh, most unassuming proportion. Like for example, I would take a really large sculpture and put it in a small apartment which would automatically turn the whole space around because it will give it scale and suddenly you, the space looks bigger than it actually is. You know, with that with the correct reflection of a mirror will, over, over, will overturn the space. And what about something like video art which is fascinates um, a lot of people but they just don't know how to use it? I think video art is, um, if used well, can actually uh, bring in so much um, depth to a space. Um, it can also, I love putting video art in, in transient spaces, for example, passages, stairwells, you know, where you do not need to engage with it 24-7, unlike a museum where you actually sit in front of it and actually go through the whole process, almost like a documentary. I try to use video arts pieces that are more on a loop, you know, so it can uh, be as, uh, the feeling of a hide and seek or pe the feeling of an approach or a, or, or a follow up, you know, which kind of when you go up and down or kind of repeatedly move towards these passages, you kind of see something different or scale or, or color, which kind of changes your perception of the space. So every time you pass that, that narrow corridor, the space looks different just because the video art playing there. So Ashish, how does, can you give us an example of within this home space, how you, how you use spaces and how you've uh, sort of used uh, challenging pieces of art? I think, uh, you know, as I said, when we come to a practice, we start speaking to the clients and then we bring them on our page for the art. This is a classic example, you know, um, the clients were so excited about the whole process of buying art uh, that it became a pleasure to you know walk them through um, they were th th when you're designing in a practice there are two kind of uh, you come across two situations one is where you build a space for an art piece and one is where the space is so um, awkward as i would say it not technically right but or what you call as a negative space that you correct it um, in both these, both these uh, kind of um, situations, art is very key and very important. For example, if you see that corner right there, uh, where it's a narrow, long space, a vertical space, a double height space, I wanted something towering, you know. And then we came to your show at, uh, um, uh, at the Mills, and we saw this beautiful work by Talur, Ellen Talur. And, um, that was it. For me, the journey was, you know, I'd reached a destination there. And then we brought the clients and we said, listen, we need to prop this up re really high and tall and vertical to give, you know, resonance to the space. Also bring in the energy of the space. You know, it suddenly became really tall and vertical and started making the space look really scaled. And then there was there are times where you kind of build an art, uh, you find an artwork to enhance the space. For example, the um, to crawl and Tagra work, which you know you have right in the center of this living room, a massive dome that kind of almost looks like a viewfinder. You know, it almost is like encompassing the city around. And it was very interesting that the uh, the artists came, uh, flew down from Delhi, and um, did an entire recce of this site and took photographs of the entire panoramic view. And then they've incorporated the view into the work. So it's literally like a mirrored dome, which kind of engulfs the outside within. What about that stunning video piece you have in your dining? Yes. So that's, uh, uh, that's a very, very important work by Ranbir Kaleka, um, um, Allegories, 11 Allegories. Um, and um, it, the, the idea was to have a very calm, serene uh, work in the dining room. So when you're sitting, you, uh, you you have something going on, but it's not obtrusive. It's not. It's not a conversation breaker. It's more a conversation maker. Also, what I loved is the idea of a candle lit dinner. You know, to be able to sit on a table and not have candles on the table, but as an artwork right there, just humming by the side. So another work um, that actually I'm very very fond of is uh, work by Asim Vakif, um, and uh, it's it talks about. To me, it talks a lot about degeneration and also the current uh, idea of the landscape of cities. You know, um, it's 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 fragmented at, and it it's got this 
uh, photo montage of kinds going on which it is almost like concrete meets metal and we wanted that to be in the outdoor space because it also reflects it is like a mirror looking out. So, you know it is like a defragmented uh, view or a perspective to the, the current situation of urban Mumbai and that is that is that was just so apt for me that we had to put it there. You know this whole idea of living with art is relatively um, uh, relatively new in urban India, but it is been part of our legacy you know from the Maharajas to uh, people have lived with crafts you know people have had their walls painted uh, by Varli by different different uh, kind of uh, art you know crafts um, uh, the different crafts of the country. And somewhere down the line urban living uh, has overtaken that you know we have forgotten that you have to live with some kind of sensitivity you know art is just not an, uh, an object it is an expression it is it's a meaning of uh, being 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 you or being your uh, having your own perspective. And that is what we try and tell our clients and that is what we try and tell the, them that you know all the spaces around the world will start looking the same what will distinguish you from your neighbor is your art. With boutiques in Mumbai, New Delhi, in, in New York's Madison Avenue and soon to be opening in Hong Kong, Nira Modi is one of India's most well-known jewellers. We speak to him about his dual passions of art and diamonds. Hi Nira, thank you so much for being a part of our show, welcome. Hi Prajita, thank you. Um, I would love to start by asking you, when did you start buying art? 1999. Wow. So what comes before, your jewellery love or your love for art? Um, you know both of them evoke emotion. Uh, of course jewellery does come first because I have been, been growing up with diamonds and jewellery. Uh, but it just it captures beauty and immortalises uh, beauty. Whenever I interact with you, I see that your love for art extends uh, itself into everything else that you do, especially the jewellery that you do. Can you tell us about some pieces that have come across from your love for art maybe? Um, so, quite a few of my collections have come across from just by observing art, by admiring art and just it's, art is beautiful. So, many years ago I saw Monet's Water Lilies in the Metropolitan Museum. Afterwards I went to Giverny and from there we started the Lotus Collection. But it is more about like I said earlier you know capturing beauty and immortalizing beauty and that is what art does and that is what jewelry does. So Nira we see that you are constantly and always surrounded by art whether it is your office which has such a large art salon or your homes. Uh, can you tell us about the significance of art in your life? Mati said I do not literally paint the table but the emotion it invokes within me. So, Art for me it is not something which is very literal but the powerful emotions, the surge of joy uh, it invokes in me and from there I get inspired to make jewellery. Can you tell me about the different parts? So, um, you know, you take different examples uh, to take the Taj Mahal or Mughal miniatures. Now from the Mughal miniatures a whole collection called the Mughal collection was inspired where we took that motif, the flower motif and we not only made a collection but we made a diamond cut called the Mughal cut. So instead of using small diamonds to create a petal, we created the, a diamond in the form of a petal. There is a beautiful painting by Souza. Uh, it's really a riot of colors and that is inspired a spring necklace with which has pink diamonds, blue diamonds, green diamonds and a multicolored diamond necklace. So can you help deconstruct the lotus collection for us and how just the steps? So when you take Monet's water lilies or um, Indian pitchwise, the lotus flower is a beautiful flower and it has a lot of spiritual significance in India. It rises above. Uh, so whatever is going on below it just rises above and we are very 
particular about the way we create our jewelry. So I gave the inspiration to designers. I, you know, as you know, I can't draw to save my life, but I can narrate. And with that narrative, they would come up with various designs, always keeping the lotus motif in mind. And it's one motif. Um, and we go into a level of detail which is exacting and insane. Um, so for example, we'll have a lotus, then we'll have another jewel with a lotus and the frond. Then we have another jewel with a lotus and a lily pad with a tiny frog on the lily pad. And then just to get that little eye right, okay, just it should not be too large or too small, otherwise the frog looks scary. Um, it took us one week. So it's very, very detail oriented. So that's it for Art Insider today. We hope you enjoyed the show. But do tune in for yet another exciting episode of Art Insider next week. But don't forget to write to us at artinsider at ndtv.com.